this week the physics department at Leighton Sixth Form College has had a loan of lunar rock and meteorites made to us by the Science and Technology Facilities Council. So during lessons this week we've been looking at the moon rock and I've been talking about the background to how the moon rock came to be collected and brought back to Earth during the Apollo missions. So I've been talking about that and giving a little bit of background to it. So I thought I'd take a video and so it can be uploaded so other people can find out a little bit about it. Hopefully you enjoy it. In September 1962, John F. Kennedy, when speaking at Rice University, laid down a challenge for the United States to send a man to the moon and return him safely back to Earth. So he made that challenge in 1962. Seven years later, on the 20th of July, 1969, the astronauts of Apollo 11 managed to succeed in meeting that challenge. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins went to the moon. Uh, Michael Collins stayed on the, the command module, which was in orbit around the moon, but Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, they went down to the moon in the lunar landing module. So, John F. Kennedy had said that he made the challenge to do it before the end of the decade, and they managed to do it with the Apollo program. Now this was all taking place in the context of what's called the space race. That's the uh, lunar landing module that the Apollo 11 astronauts went down to the moon on. The space race was all about showing which of two sides, the Soviet Union and the West, largely the Americans, was the most technologically advanced. This was all part of a tense standoff between those two sides, which is called the Cold War. During the space race, both sides made astonishing technological advancements. I think in the West, we're often largely unaware of the amazing advancements that the Soviets made. For example, they put the first satellite into orbit around the Earth, the um, Sputnik 1. They brought the first man up to space and brought him back safely, Yuri Gagarin. They performed the first spacewalk where a cosmonaut exited his space station or his spacecraft for a short time and then he went back in. And they were the first to send something to the moon. Now the Soviet, uh, and that's new too, I'll mention that, uh, the Soviet program was often more dangerous than the American program, but nonetheless these were great advancements that were made. There have been 120 missions to the moon, 58 have been successful, and 24 of those successful missions to the moon were before Apollo 11. The difference was that no, one, no human being landed on the surface of the moon. Lunar 2, which I mentioned earlier, launched by the USSR, that, that reached the lunar surface in 1959. That was the first man-made object to land on the surface of the moon. Apollo 8 was the first manned mission to the moon. Not that they landed on the moon, but they orbited it. So they were the first to escape the gravitational field of the Earth. They didn't entirely escape the gravitational field, but the main area of influence of the Earth field. And they orbited the moon 10 times, and that happened in 1968. This is a very famous photograph called Earthrise, which was taken on the Apollo 8 mission. Just as they're coming around from the far side of the moon, the Earth was appearing to rise above the horizon, and they took this photo, very famous photo, called Earthrise. The Apollo program itself consisted of six successful landings on the moon, starting with Apollo 11, then Apollo 12, 14, 15, 16 and 17, 17 being the last one. You notice that number 13 is missing. That's because that was, Apollo 13 was due to land on the moon, but there was an explosion in one of the oxygen tanks en route from the Earth to the moon, and very nearly uh, 
took the whole spacecraft out and there would have been the loss of life of the three, uh, three astronauts. But this mission is actually called the successful failure because the astronauts were able to carry out the necessary repairs to get the spacecraft to orbit the moon and come back to Earth. So it's a great story and there's been a movie made about that. It's a very famous movie, it's a good movie. You should check it out, it's called Apollo 13. So check that out. I think that was released in 97, so it shouldn't be too hard to get hold of. The Apollo program had a number of missions that led up to Apollo 11 as well, as you can imagine. Uh, these are the mission patches for those missions. These were only exist for manned missions, so there were unmanned missions and manned missions. The unmanned ones don't have an astronaut, so there's no astronaut to put the patch on their suit. That's why they only exist for manned missions, because you need an astronaut who's wearing a suit to put it onto. Apollo 1, that's the mission patch there, was due to be launched in 1967, but there was a fire at the launch pad, and unfortunately all three astronauts on board were killed. Four, five, and six were unmanned test flights, so they were testing the equipment. They, this was really pushing the envelope of um, what technology could do at the time, so there was lots of new technology that needed to be tested, so this was part of that. Apollo 7 was a manned flight, the patch is up there. That was a mission to orbit the Earth and test some of the equipment as well. So again, testing. Apollo 8, we've mentioned already, that was the first mission in which three human beings left the Earth's gravitational field and entered the region that, which is more dominated by the Moon's gravitational field. They orbited the Moon and that's the first successful manned mission to the Moon. Apollo 9, um, again the mission patch is up there. This tested all of the parts of the lunar mission in 10 days of Earth orbit. So this was the first time that the lunar module was tested in space. And then Apollo 10, the one just before Apollo 11, launched in May 1969, and that was a full dress rehearsal for our moon landing. The astronauts went to the moon, they orbited, and then they detached the lunar module from the command and service module, and they took it down close to the moon's surface, to, into a low lunar orbit, and then having done that, they jettisoned the landing equipment and went back to redock with the command and service module. That's what it was meant to do, it wasn't meant to land on the moon, it was meant to just get really close and test all of the equipment before Apollo 11 astronauts would attempt to land on the moon. There is just over 382 kilograms of lunar rock on Earth. Uh, there are significant differences between rock on Earth and rock on the moon, so we can be confident that the rock came from the moon itself. Apollo 17, and I'm mentioning Apollo 17 in particular, because the rock that we had came from the Apollo 17 mission. That was the last manned mission to the moon and it was launched in 72. That returned with 111 kilograms of moon rock. All lunar rock that comes from the Apollo missions is considered to be priceless, so it can't be bought with money, it can't be insured because it's priceless. However, in the past, um, you, we should know that the Soviets sent three unmanned missions to the moon to collect samples of rock, and they returned with under half a kilogram of rock. And in 93, they, uh, three small fragments from one of those missions were sold for $450,000. And that, that sample weighed about 0.2 kilo, sorry, 0.2 grams. So a very tiny amount of rock was sold for a very large sum of money. And in 2002, some lunar rock was stolen. And, and then during the court case, NASA had to give an estimate of the value of 285 grams of the lunar rock from this Apollo mission. And they valued it at $1 million. So, that gives you some idea of the scale of the cost we're talking about here. 
Those samples were later recovered in 2003. That's one of the Apollo 17 astronauts on a lunar rover or sometimes called a moon buggy. The way that moon rock was collected was through the astronauts using a variety of tools. They used hammers, rakes, scoops, tongs and core tubes to collect the rock. But before doing so they would take photographs of the samples so that back on Earth we could be clear on how, how it was before the sample was collected. These are the three Apollo 17 astronauts. And during the course of these lectures actually, a, a number of students have cast out whether the moon landings actually took place. And it's still very common actually, if you go on YouTube you'll see lots of videos, recent videos, saying that the lunar landings never actually happened. So, uh, did the lunar landings happen? I've discussed some of the arguments against the moon landings with my students. So students will mention the, the waving flag or the sources of lighting and so on. And those arguments can be debunked. But in addition to that, I want to give some evidence that they, some good evidence, I think, that they did actually go. The first piece of evidence is that there are laser retro reflectors on the surface of the moon and the only mission that, were, that planted those were the Apollo missions. So you have to explain how those retro reflectors got to the surface of the moon. They, maybe you would say they got there by some unmanned mission. Well, what, which unmanned mission put the laser retro reflectors there? You should be able to provide evidence that that actually happened. It's most sensible to believe that they were placed there by the Apollo astronauts. The purpose of these retro reflectors is that they're placed on the surface of the moon and then uh, institutions on Earth with extremely powerful lasers fire laser pulses up to the moon targeting these retro reflectors and the light is reflected, comes back to Earth and the data is used to measure the distance to a high precision between the Earth and the moon. So we know they're there because otherwise that experiment would not be possible. Number two, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera recently launched 2011 and, or around about 2011 and that has captured images of Apollo 12, 14 and 17 landing sites. It's orbiting the moon and taking photographs of the surface and here's one of the photos showing the Apollo 17 landing site for example. So you can see a lot of detail in these photos including the experiment packages that the Apollo astronauts were using, the descent stages, the flag, the lunar roving vehicle, the moon buggy tracks as well, and even astronaut footpaths. So what was making the footpaths if there was no people on the surface of the moon? So that's the second part of the evidence, which I would say is very good evidence that the Apollo landings actually happened. And thirdly, there is so much moon rock on, on Earth. Where did it all come from if they didn't actually go to the moon to collect it? And for comparison, the Apollo missions came back with 382 kilograms of rock. Three unmanned Soviet missions, which no one disputes that they actually went to the moon, collected samples and came back, they collected less than half a kilogram. And the mineral composition of the rock is consistent. So we know that the rock from the Apollo missions came from the moon. So how do you get so much? We know that unmanned missions, robots, can't collect rock very effectively. So that's why the Soviet missions collected so little in, in comparison. But to collect 380 kilograms, you would need to put someone on the moon who can manipulate tools and collect those samples. So I'd say that's very good evidence that the lunar landings did actually happen, in addition to debunking the, actual, the accusations of it being a hoax. For example, the, the waving flag, there is no video showing the flag in the ground with no one touching it and the flag waving. 
So the accusation that there, there was wind when they were placing the flag is nonsense. Uh, the, there may, no, may not be an atmosphere on the moon, but there is still inertia. So by moving the flagpole, we would expect the flag to be moving as well, because it's all attached and then it would be following around the movement of the flagpole. So similarly, arguments can be made against the accusations of it being a hoax. Let me tell you about the rock samples that we actually have here. We had a sample of lunar rock, a few, couple of hundred grams worth of lunar rock. It's all enclosed in perspex because lunar rock is so rare and so precious that it can't, actually, it can't be touched, can't be left open to the atmosphere to avoid contamination and being worn down by being handled. So there, these rocks include samples that were collected by Apollo 17 and they were from different, there were different methods of formation such as being made by violent collisions or when uh, meteorites hit the surface of the moon from volcanic activity and so on. So we had a sample of, had samples of different types of rock formation. And we've got a sample of rare meteorites as well. So these were collected at various points around the Earth, for, like Antarctica, Mexico, Namib Namibia, and, and US, USA. So we had a disk of meteorites as well, which were quite rare. And in addition to that, we had some other, those meteorites can't be touched because they're in the Perspex disk, but we did have some meteorites which could be handled as well, a Nikolai one, the Libyan desert glass, and the parasite section as well. Uh, the parasite section has been cut so that we can see the various layers involved. These are the lunar rock samples which we had from the Apollo 17 mission. There are three types of rock and three types of soil. So there's there's variety of the rock and soil on the surface of the moon. The basalt here was is solidified lava. Um, Brachia are rocks made of fragments of, from other rocks which were created by violent impacts on the surface of the moon. The anorthrosite is white rock and that's the predominant type of rock in the highlands on there. The Mara soil, that's fragments from the breakup of rocks by meteorites, so where meteorites have impacted on the surface of the moon. Highland soil. That's, again, fragments of breakup of rocks by um, meteorites. And then orange soil, these are volcanic glass beads from lunar eruptions. This is almost certainly the most expensive thing I've ever held. That's our lunar rock that we had on loan. This is a section of a meteorite which landed on the Earth a long time ago first discovered in 1576. This is a heavy chunk of rock, predominantly nickel and iron, and the meteorite itself, the whole meteorite, was, of what's been found so far, had a mass of 60 tonnes. So that's the heaviest meteorite that's ever been found on Earth. A lot of the students have been very impressed with this one. It's very heavy, very impressive rock. There's this palisite section. This is a section of a meteorite which has been cut very thinly and there's some translucent material there, olivine, which you can see if you put a light source behind it. You can see the different minerals and metals present in the sections. This is a very nice one. This is Libyan desert glass. This is found strewn across the Libyan desert. It's actually terrestrial rock, but probably formed by an extraterrestrial event where a meteoroid or something similar passed by close to the Earth, very low, and there was an intense blast of heat as it passed by, melting the desert rock. So that's the current theory anyway. So uh, this is called a tektite, which is the technical word for rock that's been formed by melting 
under intense heat. You can see some of the unmolten sand in there as well. 